One. About five years ago, I, a 35-year-old male, had a lovely roommate experience. I'll try to be brief, but I have to set the stage. I had a bit of a midlife crisis, and quit my job and hiked through the AT, decided to start my own business with an old college friend, and move across the country. When I did, I moved into a room in the house he was renting from an old high school friend of his. For my $600 a month, I got a bedroom and a house full of miserable bastards. G was my business partner and fellow renter. MC, 25 female, is daddy's little girl that stays rent-free with her boy toy, 24 male, in the master suite. G has a traveling job, so he and I are working on starting the business, of course, while he is here, but that's not much. So we worked on it over the phone, or FaceTime, whatever needed to be done. So I spent a lot of my time there with these strangers, trying to be cordial, clean dishes, cooked food for the group, tried to act like a guest, even though I technically was a tenant. Well, that's just say that they didn't seem to want me there, and G, my only ally, was on the road like eight weeks out of ten, was physically assaulted by the boy toy, because he was upset I was working too hard and showing him and his boys up. I got a part-time job at the same landscaping spot as him to keep money coming in. Their behavior got better when G was around, but always turned to being cold again and occasionally violent as soon as he left. Boy Toy was definitely physically abusive to MC as well. Daddy, mid-forties, would play video games and act oblivious to all of it. I think this is why both of them hated me so much, because I would step in when it got violent. Even though Boy Toy was much bigger than me, I was apparently the only person who would give him hell for his bull. G was never there, or maybe he would have. Some of these scenes got ugly, as you might imagine. So eventually it became apparent that we would need to move closer to the metro area to get the business where it needed to be. Also, to get out of that situation to say the least, so we did, and moved out as well. That apparently caused some issues. G and I were paying $1,200 in rent combined, and I'm sure were paying their mortgage. None of them worked with any regularity, so when we moved, they seemed to be okay with it. But you know, passive-aggressive stuff like claiming kitchenware items were theirs that were mine and stuff like that. Anyways, here is where the story really starts. One day we get an appointment, for up in their area actually, which wasn't odd at all. So I went to serve the customer and it ends up being an obviously vacant home. We had never had something like this happen before, so I started wondering, as one does, what is really going on. So after a few minutes, I figured I'd try a Google search on the phone number and see what happens. I didn't think anything would come up, but I was wrong. MC is not the sharpest tool in the shed. MC decided that it would be a fun prank to schedule an appointment with me via text on her burner phone. Coincidentally, she had used this burner phone's number to advertise herself on an escort site, with photos and everything. It came right up in the Google search. Whatever. If that is what she wants to do, I won't judge. But I do know that Daddy will. I also know that Daddy is the only way to stop her horseshit pranks. Lastly, I know that Daddy doesn't grow his cannabis within legal constraints. So I put together a nice little text message to Daddy, including the screenshots of her setting the appointment with me showing her number, then a screenshot of her escort page. I told him if I hear from her or even him again, his not-so-secret grow is going to become not-so-secret anymore. I haven't heard from either of them since. Good riddance. 2. This may not seem too petty for some, however, for a people-pleasing introverted pushover, who is terrified of conflict, this is the best I could do. A little background about me. I, 30 and female, used to work at a daycare for five years before moving on to being a receptionist for an optometrist. This particular office is one of the ones you can find in Walmart, Target, Costco, etc. 
That particular bit of information will be important later, I promise. I am also not an early morning person. I hate waking up before 8 or 9 a.m. for work. I always lay in bed for as long as possible before getting up and going on about my day. On with the story. A retinal imaging machine broke down a week or so ago. It's a machine that takes a scan of the back of your eye. The repair guy was supposed to show up at 8 a.m. this morning. We open at 10. My boss has young children and she has to get ready for school at that time. So I got the... <clears throat> honor of showing up two hours early. My alarm goes off at 7 a.m. and I accidentally turn it off instead of hitting snooze. Luckily, I live 10 minutes away from the office and I woke up before 7.30. I get up, rub the sleep from my eyes and quickly put on my scrubs. I leave with just enough time to grab breakfast beforehand. I get to the office right around 8 a.m. and begin my morning routine. 8.15 rolls around and the repair guy still hasn't shown up. I'm messaging my boss with all the updates. As the minutes continue to tick by, my ire only continues to grow. 8.30 rolls around, all my tasks are done, and there's still no sign of the repair guy. I begin messaging my boss again, threatening to sacrifice the stupid repair people to the heathen gods, should they not show up today. My boss assures me that they confirmed we were on their schedule. She has received no phone call or email or any form of communication about whether or not they're on their way or running late or already there. I said that if they don't show up by 8.45, I was going to blast the most annoying music I could find on Spotify while they worked. I began adding music to my new revenge playlist as I wait. 8.45 and still nothing. Their fate has been sealed. I rub my hands together with a crazed gleam in my eye. Finally, close to 9 a.m., they show up. Apparently, they were waiting at the wrong spot since 8 a.m. Oh. Why didn't they call to confirm? That is one of the greatest mysteries of the universe. I open the door and beckon them inside, much like a spider would a fly. I was waiting inside the store since 8 a.m. I tried this door and the one next to you at 8.15. The only door to the office is located outside the store, which means they pulled on the door once and left without ever knocking. I'm not able to see the door from my spot at the desk, so by the time I got up to check the door, they were already gone. Also, the doctor's name and office name are on the door. But he was waiting inside for you, you might say. Ah, so he was waiting by the glasses shop. Yes, that's very common. That's why we have a sign on a table near the entrance, inside and on the outside of the door, next to ours telling people where the office is located. Now I know you're not supposed to mess with the IT guy. That's the best way to screw up your entire company, usually. I'm very respectful to the IT people on the phone, I joke with them, appreciate their work, and I keep on their good side, but this guy, this company, these absolute buffoons, we, and by we, I mean the doctor mostly, have had issues with them previously, issues that are not mine to disclose. They showed up an hour late, no call, no knocking, didn't even bother to read any of the signs. I have been at this office since 8 in the morning. I am beyond tired. I am beyond done with any and all nonsense. So what was my revenge, you ask? I made a playlist of kids bop, children's songs, and various other annoying as fuck songs that has been playing for an hour while they're working. How can you stand it? Remember when I said I worked at a daycare for five years? These songs were my jam the entire time I was working there. I can listen to these songs with little to no damage to my sanity. Baby Shark? I sing that randomly throughout the day anyway. Wheels on the Bus? That slaps real hard too. Baby Bumblebee? Oh hell yeah, Kids Pop? Unpopular opinion is that they don't suck as much as people say they do. But it's not just children's songs I have playing. Oh no. 
I also have gems such as they're taking the hobbits to Isengard and why is the rum gone? And my personal favorite, the Lil John remix of Cooking by the Book. You know, the one that goes from being a simple, upbeat kids song to Now break it down, bitch. Let me see you back it up. Within a few lines. The doctor for today has shown up and has been giving me concerned glances. This explains so much, she said. <laughs> She's not wrong. Even the repair guy stopped what he was doing to check on us because he thought he heard us crying. Nah, it was just one of the repeat after me songs that repeats the same thing over and over and over and over and over until you lose all sense of yourself and feel your sanity dripping away bit by bit until nothing is left but an empty drooling husk of your former self. This playlist has been playing for the past hour at least as a form of punishment for not knocking or calling or anything. Do I have regrets? Not a single bloody one! I can keep jamming without taking any psychic damage. I hope he has good rolls against sanity checks, because he has to clear a 17 to pass. d and nerds, where are you at? This concludes my minor tale of petty revenge. Maybe it's not perfect, maybe it's not all that petty. But it makes me feel better, okay? Update. It's been almost five hours and I'm still going strong. I even started singing along to some of them at the top of my lungs. And you had best believe I'm also dancing in my chair. Three. So last week I experienced something quite funny in its own right at work and thought I'd share it here. So, because my company's rules with dealing with shoplifters are in short, don't directly ask to check people's bags on the way out or accuse people of stealing if you think and are not 100% sure they are stealing as it might aggravate the shoplifter. My co-workers and I would mainly stay out of it, as infuriating as that may be or at most stand at the end of the aisle they're in and glare at them to telepathically will them to drop our gift bag they grabbed and start stuffing with other merchandise. To set the stage, it's 5.50 p.m., 10 minutes before closing, and I've just made the first we're closing, get your stuff and check out call over the intercom. It's just myself, a 20-year-old female, and co-worker Mike, 17 male, on shift. In walks a woman who immediately ducks her head and flicks her hood up, like she's about to close a sketchy drug deal in the back of the store, grey jacket lady beelines for the fabric bags we sell at the checkouts where I am, serving another customer, then immediately turns and speed walks into the store like she's late for a meeting in the snack section. Now this is weird. Usually 9 out of 10 customers grab a bag at the checkout, so my inner monologue at this point is, here we go. I check out my final customer for the minute and radio Mike. Keep an eye on the woman in the grey hoodie with the hood over her head. She just grabbed the bag and zoomed into the snack aisle. I know we can't do much, but maybe we can call security if she starts stuffing the bag. A side note, security in my country is honestly pretty useless. They can't touch you physically or block you at all. Well, I was gonna wait to start closing the doors, but I'll be up in a sec. The large panel doors to the main exit and entry to the store are usually closed by the person who's not on the registers at around 5.50pm each night, leaving just enough room to allow the last customer or two out of the store before full closing. Mike, the absolute legend he is, closed the doors early, not locking, leaving no gaps to allow customers out unless they want to drag a heavy door themselves. Not a very fun exit for a shoplifter. Grey hoodie woman hears the doors being dragged and bolts for the exit, blocked off, followed by another woman looking equally as panicked. Mike and I grin as we realize they both have their bags stuffed with items from the store. I'm in the middle of checking out our final customer for the night, while this is happening, do keep in mind, a sweet older woman who's enjoying the show as much as Mike and I. Both shoplifters start wailing on the doors, bashing and searching for an exit, like a couple of blind mice petrified of the cat on their tails. 
I say in a sweet tone. Excuse me, ladies, I'm positive everything in those bags is from the store. The bags as well, in fact. We know that stuff is ours. We saw what you two did, says Mike. The shoplifters are still smashing the doors with their fists, filling up and down as they both scream at us incoherently, <laughs> throwing in expletives, of course, regarding Mike and I. Eventually, though, Mike does open the door slightly to let out the sweet older lady, and unfortunately the two stars of the show slip past and run as fast as they can. A little bit of an anticlimactic end, as, you know, policy says you can't just grab the bag off them. But it was still fun to watch the panic and fear in their eyes. 4. A few years back, I was looking for another job. I had returned to the UK after working abroad, and I wanted a change of scenery and didn't like the direction where my employer at the time wanted to take my career. It was difficult for me to find a job that was a natural extension. I needed to take a sidestep, which I guess is normal when you're in a middle management or mid-level consultant role. I was also applying for jobs in February, which was a bit out of cycle for job hires. I found a job that was pretty perfect for me, and it was advertised by two different headhunters. For background, headhunters are paid a substantial finder's fee in the UK by employers for matching a job opening to a candidate. Typically, three months of pay so they don't have to recruit many to earn their salary. For the job in question, headhunter Anthony asked for my CV. Fine, here you go. Asked to meet. Fine, I'm available on so-and-so date, so let's meet. Anthony proceeded to interview me. After the interview, Anthony said he doesn't think I qualify for the role. The position is for a company that is top in the industry, and they only recruit the best, blah blah blah. But we'll keep my CV and let me know if another role comes up. Okay, understood. Sarah, from the other headhunter company, then approaches me and asks if I'm interested in the same exact position. I let her know that Anthony said I wouldn't be a good fit and she suggested doing the interview with the company anyway. Did the three rounds of interviews, which went very well, and two weeks later was offered the job. I spoke to my boss just after I was hired, and she explained that very few candidates were being put forward by Anthony and his company, and those put forward weren't a good fit, so she recently asked Sarah to look into it. So Anthony lost out in three months of my pay. My boss then went on maternity leave a year later, and we recruited her replacement. Guess who was offered the job postings? Sarah, so another commission lost. We then decided to change the company's structure and massively expanded. From a team of three to a team of six, with a subsidiary company we recruited 20 to 30 contractors over a three-year period. Again, Sarah got the lion's share of the job posting over those years. I was promoted and deciding which recruiting firms we used for these three new jobs and these contractors. So I deprioritized CVs forwarded by Anthony and his team. I checked Anthony's company's accounts a couple of weeks ago, and they went from 9 million annual revenue for the three years leading to my interview, to 7.9 million revenue that year, and 7 million revenue a year thereafter until they restructured. They never recovered. 5. Long story that happened a long time ago. When my wife and I started out, we rented an apartment, owned by a fellow who lived three hours away. He'd come to town every few weeks to collect rents and do any fixing one of his properties needed. The first apartment was one he had just remodeled, Unfortunately, he wasn't the smartest tag in the box because he removed the radiator in the living room because it looked ugly. Then winter came and the apartment was so cold that the water dripping in the faucet was freezing into an icicle. He moved us to a house which was upstairs of a nice older couple. The next month the older couple move out and he rents it to two young girls. 
These girls are loud as can be, having parties almost every night. Our son was just a few months old at the time, and the parties kept waking him up. As many times as I complained to the landlord and the girls, nothing happened. I ended up calling the police a few times when the party got out of control. I know the landlord was married, but I think he had some arrangement with these two girls. After one night having to call the police, the next day we came home to see fresh snowy footprints on the steps. Then I began to notice things were moved when we would get home after being gone. I changed the lock on the door. About a month later, I hear someone trying to open the door. I go down and it's the landlord with two other girls, and he was expecting to show them our apartment. In his mind, he was kicking us out because in his books we were behind in rent. When he would come to town, we would always give him a check for rent. He once admitted to me that sometimes he would cash the check and go to the strip club. Fortunately, the next month we were able to secure another apartment and moved out. However, the landlord took us to court for past due rent. In court, he presented the judge with his bookkeeping, showing we owed $850 in past rent. We had gathered all the checks written to him for rent and presented them to the judge. After looking through all the checks and totaling them up, the judge asked the landlord to verify all his signatures. Once the landlord verified that all the signatures on every check were his, the judge said there is a $600 difference in favor of the renters. The landlord was fined $50 for court costs, plus he had to pay us the $600. We never got paid, but the sheriff department contacted us a few months later to see if the judgment had been completed. When I told them no, they said, we will do a bank hold on him. So the sheriff placed a hold on his account. The first time $600 was put in his account, the sheriff took it and sent it to us. That prompted a phone call from the landlord's wife. She started in on me as to why we had money taken from their account, because it caused them to bounce a few checks. So I told her your husband obviously forgot to enter several checks he cashed for cash and spent at the strip club. I'm guessing things didn't go well when he got home. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Revenge is Ice Cream, episode 298. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Before you go, please do poke the like button. Thank you kindly. And if you'd like to get the videos a little bit early, then you can support me through my Patreon, which is linked in the description. And there you'll also find a link to the Hellfreezer merchandise store, where you can treat yourself to some Hellfreezer merchandise. And you can also make donations during streams or videos like this one. While this is not required, I do appreciate it and it helps me out a bit. Okay. No other business, so let's move right along to Hellfreezer's question of the day. And today's question is... How many chances would you give someone, a friend or a family member, when they've messed up before you say, done, I'm washing my hands, I'm moving on? I used to be quite liberal. If I felt someone was sincerely regretful, apologetic, and genuinely would resolve the change, I'd give people as many chances as I thought they needed to get there. But time has made me jaded as I think it does all of us. And essentially, I believe in second chances, but I don't believe in 15th chances, or even third chances. So, you get one you get one chance to not screw it up, then you screw it up, then you get a second chance, and after that I'm done with you. Let me know what you think in a comment below. And with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.